here that I still have. I encourage you to turn your Bibles back to the Ezra passage, Ezra chapter 7, we'll spend most of our time, page 672 if you are following along in the same Bibles that we have here. If you're following along on your phone, turn off your notifications. I've worked out that I'm nowhere near as interesting as people's notifications. Do you struggle with talking to people about Jesus? I could sort of say I know you do or most of you do because you've often raised it with me. How could Aunt Martha ever respond? How could I raise that in my family context or my work context? In, how, how do we talk to people about Jesus? We know God's plan and God's purposes are for us to take the good news of the gospel to all the nations. Maybe he's using someone else. Maybe he's just going to make it happen. Surely God doesn't want me to be talking to people who are imposed to him about Jesus. Or maybe indifferent to him, like water off a duck's back. Smile and wave. Yes, we're all Christians, we're all going to heaven, aren't we? And last week we saw uh, that Ezra turned up in Jerusalem... It's a good time to turn up. You're more than halfway through the book that's in his name and he finally turns up. Um, he'd been sent, surprisingly, with the goodwill of the great king Artaxerxes. That's actually quite astounding. Sure, we've heard it plenty of times, but how could it occur? In chapter 4, we read one of the letters that King Artaxerxes had, done, had written, obviously earlier, and he shut down any work that was happening on the rebuilding of the walls of the Jerusalem. It was no-go zone. Not safe, don't do. How could we ever obey God and work out, fulfil his plans and purposes when the great king has made it illegal? We've read a number of times in the book of Ezra, there's long-held opposition to God's people doing what God had planned them to do, re resettling and rebuilding in Jerusalem. God had promised it would happen, but it does seem like for most of the book of Ezra, that those opposed to the will of God have stopped it. But by chapter 7, we read uh, King Artaxerxes is now supporting the work of God through his people. Before the change of heart happened, it would be right for the people of God to be discouraged and asking this question, how can followers of Yahweh fulfill his purposes in a world that is so hard to live for him and to speak about him. When a kingdom that we're in, he seems opposed to him. How will God's plan and purposes ever come to pass? Now, we live in a very different situation than Ezra, which is good. But as we look at Ezra chapter 7, I think we should be encouraged, maybe challenged about serving God in a world that has always been opposed to him or indifferent to him. Why don't we pray? Our Lord and our God, we pray that as your word speaks to us this morning, we will be encouraged. Help me be faithful to your word. Help our ears and hearts to be open. May your spirit work in us. May we not just be distracted by things that don't matter. We ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. I thought last week Dan really helpfully opened God's word to us at the beginning of chapter 7. We saw how Ezra had a mission for his life. He was the Blues Brothers on a mission from God. Chapter 7 verse 10, what does Ezra do? He devotes himself to the study of God's word. How good is that? If you want someone to lead you well... Well, actually, if someone's going to lead you well, regardless of whether you like it or not, you want them to be devoted to the study of God's Word. But a story in it in their heads is a waste of time. Lots of information is no different to what Satan has. Lots of information about God. He can quote God's Word when he needs to. Ezra didn't just want to know it in his head. He wants to put it into practice. Ezra doesn't want to be like the people of the past who had known God's word, could parrot God's word off, but disobeyed it all the same. That's what ended them in exile in the first place, wasn't it? Ignoring God's word, 
is a dangerous thing to do if you claim to be God's people. Well, actually, ignoring God's word is dangerous to do, regardless of who you claim to be. Ezra wanted to know God's word and to obey God's word. But it didn't just stop there. Ezra was the great leader, a great leader to have, not because he did great things, but he knew God's word, he obeyed God's word, and his passion was to teach God's word to God's people. That's what you want out of a leader, isn't it? And Dan said last week, it doesn't just stop with Ezra. That's the sort of people we want to be, people who know God's word, who obey God's word and teach God's word. And in the passage we are looking at today, we're going to see the authority that Ezra has in seeking to teach people about Yahweh and what Yahweh wants his people to do. Uh, the first section of Ezra, probably from really chapters 1 to 6, is all focused on getting God's people back into Jerusalem, to the house of God, to be setting up the right worship of Yahweh. But it doesn't just stop with ceremonies. God's people have always had to be people who worship God rightly, let's say on the Sabbath in the temple, and who live it out all the other times as well because worship is not just located to Sunday mornings 10 o'clock worship is what we do all of our lives you can't switch on your worship of Yahweh and switch it off when something else more interesting turns up and so the book of Ezra wants God's people to know God's word worship him rightly in the temple which for us is slightly different because of Jesus and live out what it means to be God's people and that's actually what chapters 7, 8, 9 and 10 focus on. What is Ezra's authority to do this? Well you could say well we know the answer to that one Rick it's Jesus or it's God or it's Yahweh or something like that but I think we need to unpack a little more and see why that authority for Ezra actually should encourage us as God's people today. So Ezra quotes Verse 12, it starts in Aramaic because that's what the letter was written in. That's the language of the time. That's the way the Persian Empire communicated. And so, verse 12 through to verse 26 is in Aramaic, a letter from King Artaxerxes. And we read very clearly that King Artaxerxes is a big bloke. He's a powerful person. He makes it very clear that he has absolute authority in his kingdom. He is the one that decrees who can move where or move where in his kingdom. God's people can go home to Jerusalem if they want to, but only because Artaxerxes has decreed it. He allows them to return to the land to worship Yahweh, as we'll see, not because he's suddenly become a follower of Yahweh, but he's decreed it should happen. And in Artaxerxes tells Ezra what he can do. Ezra what he can do with the money he's given him, he gives him great freedom, by the way, but he gives him freedom to do with the leftovers whatever he wants according to the will of God, his God, but only because Artaxerxes has decreed it. In verse 21, Artaxerxes uh, decrees what the royal treasurers can do, the Persian treasurers throughout the empire, and particularly in the place where Ezra is going back to, in the area of the trans-Euphrates, you must do with your money what, whatever, uh, uh, up to a limit of course, uh, we know he puts limits on because Artaxerxes is inherited off his dad, an almost bankrupt kingdom. But incredibly generously, he gives them enormous amounts for them to be able to, well actually they're commanded to give to Ezra. Because King Artaxerxes has decreed it. And at the end of the letter surprisingly even more so, King Artaxerxes decrees that the laws of, of Ezra's God should be taught and anyone who disobeys him gets punished. Artaxerxes is a man of ultimate authority in his mind, almost. He has ultimate authority in his kingdom, doesn't he? But even in his great position of power, he is aware that he's not God. He's a smart man. Verse 12, Ezra is a priest. He's a teacher of the law, the law of the God of heaven. 
You see, Artaxerxes knows who is a greater authority than him. That's always good to be aware of, isn't it? Verse 23, Artaxerxes tells us in his letter why he's allowing all this to happen. Why, would, why ever would the king of kings send Ezra back to make sure that worship is happening properly amongst God's people, Yahweh's people? Well, it's certainly not because Artaxerxes follows God. Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, he says, verse 23, let it be done with, the, with diligence for the temple of the, of the God of heaven. Why should his wrath fall on the realm of the king and of his son? Great expense has been, been, give, been um, uh, incurred because Artaxerxes doesn't follow Yahweh. He just wants to cover his basis. He, he wants to protect the rule of himself and his dynasty, his sons. And as we read in the letter he writes, he refers to Ezra's God as the God of heaven, your God, not my God, not Yahweh. Astounding, isn't it, that a pagan king could be so keen for the right worship of God to occur. He would know about Yahweh. You couldn't be king of the Persian Empire and know, not know what's happened in both the Persian Empire, his own dad who was married to Esther with Xerxes. You remember that story? If you don't, go and read Esther later. Don't do it now. Or maybe you could go back and read what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. Ended up eating grass, not smoking it, eating it. Because God is God. You see, Artaxerxes knows that Yahweh is not one to be trifled with. But he's not a follower, he's just concerned about him. He's covering his bases. He wants Yahweh's favour on his dynasty and his leadership but he's not worshipping him. And the incredible nature of this is not lost on God's people. Uh, God's people come back into the picture in verse 27. The book of Ezra goes back to the Hebrew language. After quoting the letter from Artaxerxes. Let me read to you verse 27 and 28 because you get an idea how God's people are responding to this reality praise be to the lord the god of our ancestors who has put it into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the lord in jerusalem in this way who has extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials because of the hand of the lord my god was upon me was on me i took courage and gathered leaders from israel to go up with me god's people in response to what God has done in the life or in the decree that Artaxerxes has given, because God has put it into his heart of this pagan king, even if his motives are self-preservation and the protection of his dynasty, he is enabling God, Yahweh, to be rightly worshipped and rightly taught amongst his people. God is to be praised. He's the cause, he has caused the great and powerful king to act favourably towards God's people, to change his mind and act favourably to God's people. Ezra can now get on with teaching God's word to God's people unhindered. How powerful is God? How good is God? Now, Ezra acts in this way. He sees God opening the door and he's encouraged He's spurred on, verse 28 says. He's encouraged because the hand of Yahweh, his God, is upon him. Here's a passage. What do we do with something like that? Go out and fight God's battles because he is with you? Let me tell you how to misuse the Bible, and people do. We can pick up one of the verses I think is a great idea and we read here that King Artaxerxes declares tax-free status for those who lead God's people. We could use, we could miss you, sorry, this passage and say, there you go, God's word wants our governments to give us tax-free status as a church. Artaxerxes gave them that tax-free status, wouldn't that be great if we as worshippers of Yahweh had 
tax-free status. I don't know about you guys, but certainly those involved, involved in the temple worship, I could get tax-free status, couldn't I? But Romans 13 sort of puts a, a pause on that misuse of the Bible. Romans 13 tells us to pay taxes to pagan rulers. We won't unpack it now, but Romans, when you look at the Bible and you look at all of what the Bible says, Romans 13, I think verses 1 to 7, talk about that. And there's an extra benefit, astounding benefit, that our tax exodus gives. Remember, his kingdom is inherited almost bankrupt. But God is sovereign. God can actually change the heart of a pagan king to give extraordinary benefits to God's people who are doing God's work. Another way to misuse this passage would be to take it as some sort of universal promise that if you and I get on with serving God, God will make our lives comfortable and easy and the government will get on board with our plans and purposes. That would be a complete misuse of the Bible. Uh, most of Ezra, God's people are, in, uh, well, actually the rulers of the people or the people in the land locally are opposed to God's people obeying God. Most of the book of Ezra talks about that, which makes this change of Artaxerxes' heart so amazing. You see, this is not a promise that God will make life comfortable for those who follow Yahweh, very much the opposite. God can make life comfortable. But if you read the New Testament and that passage that we had from Philippians, we see very quickly that living as God's people is not a walk in the park, it's not a Sunday school picnic, it is hard yakka and God promises us that things will not be easy. So it would be a misuse of the Bible to take this as a universal promise. It's not a promise today that our governments will get on board with the plans and purposes of the gospel-hearted church. It's not a promise that it will be easy for you to obey what God's word says as we take the gospel to all the nations. So don't wait for it to become easy. What is this passage about? Something actually we've heard a number of times in the book of Ezra. It started, Ezra chapter 1 tells us that God is in control, that God is sovereign. And it's come up a few times as we've made our way through the book. God is in complete control of all things and all people and he can and does change the hearts of pagan kings to bring about his plans and purposes and we've heard that before and it would be easy for us to switch off but how does that actually impact the way that you live i am a follower of yahweh i'm untouchable no that's arrogance isn't it that's unloving arrogance. You can't live an ungodly way and claim that God has give, allowed it to happen. But you should be confident. Whether things are going well or things are not going well, you should be confident that God is in control. How does the complete control of God in this world fill you with confidence as you serve Jesus? Because there's parts of this world that are overwhelming, aren't there? You could watch the news. You could just live out your life and know that, how overwhelming life can be. It does seem like the plans and purposes of God are opposed at very often almost every level. You see, sadly, people who claim to represent the Christian worldview try and fill you with fear in a world where people are opposed to Jesus. And literally, as I was writing that same sentence, I got an email that was trying to fill me with fear, to activate my deep dissatisfaction, my fear of how bad the, the world's becoming. It was to do with that Olympic thing, that last supper scene. Haven't seen it except for what's in the news. But it's the typical response that you'd expect from people who are trying to fill you with fear. Even Elon Musk, did you know, is worried about it. And he's always a good advice giver to Christians in the world. You see, how should a Christian respond when the gospel is mocked or a painting 
is mocked. Filled with rage, angry, motivated to write a letter of dissatisfaction. When Jesus was on the cross, what were the disciples doing apart from being fearful? They were not writing letters of dissatisfaction to the government, I can tell you that much. The right response when God is mocked is to be people who look for gospel opportunity. God uses pagan kings to bring about his plans and purposes. I'm sure God can use a pagan Olympic movement to further his purposes if we look for gospel opportunity rather than get upset and outraged and express dissatisfaction that our values are not upheld by a society who doesn't even know what they are, just likes mocking it. God's purposes are to make disciples of all the nations. What is the gospel opportunity that an event like that gives us? God was not caught unawares with that event. It didn't blindside him and it didn't upset him any more than you and I do when we reject his right to rule our own lives. What is the gospel opportunity? Well, how would you raise that event in a way which points people to the goodness of Jesus? It's going to be different in every conversation, isn't it? In every situation. I can't just put a broad smattering out of how you might do that and this is one size fits all. It depends on the people you're talking to. Let me tell you what it doesn't involve. It doesn't involve us building uh, a fence or a a hot wall of hostility that we have been treated in an outrageous way or that the God that we follow has been mocked. He's always been mocked. We mock Jesus when we put our trust in our money and our wealth and we are followers of Jesus. We are no better. What is the gospel opportunity? It's not all all that long ago that there was quite a powerful and hugely influential group of people travelling the Western world, openly mocking Jesus. The New Atheist Movement. They held a convention in Melbourne, it was sold out. They held conventions all around the world that were sold out. And at every opportunity, they mocked Jesus. And they had plenty of opportunities. Funny enough... No one will underwrite their movement and hold a convention anymore. They've imploded. And in the providence of God, doesn't mean that atheists have stopped existing, the new atheist movement has imploded, and in the providence of God, all of their anti-Jesus work, what did it do? It actually increased the level of conversation about Jesus. It actually increased the number of people in the Western world wanting to know about Jesus, much to their their disgust. Gospel opportunity that we had, not necessarily in Adelaide, when a bus drove past us and told us that God is dead, you can probably sleep in on Sunday mornings, raised the level of gospel conversation for those who wanted to take it. What did you do? Were you outraged that the bus told us God was dead? Probably. No. Use the opportunities that God gives us. Talk about who Jesus is and what he did and why it's so good. Why do you believe? Give a reason for the hope you have. Do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. The new atheist movement gave us plenty of opportunities to talk about Jesus. And so does anyone who mocks Jesus, whether it be the Olympic movement or your parents or your next door neighbour or your boss at work or the person who can't work out why you set aside Sunday morning to gather together with God's people. Much to their horror, the New Atheist movement have failed. But Satan's still opposed to God. People will continue to openly mock him. Sometimes they'll privately mock him. 
rather than getting upset with that, God is not upset with the mocking. He's upset that people are missing out on eternity. Rather than getting outraged, be people who know that God is in control. Be people who look for the gospel opportunity in this broken world to go about the plans and purposes God has set in front of us to make disciples of all the nations. A number of years ago, we were visited here by a family um, that came to Tea Tree Gully Anglican Church. Um, They live in Beirut. They lived in Beirut then. They live in Beirut now. In the Bakar Valley, it's not necessarily a pleasant place to live. It's not any more pleasant today than it was then, I believe. I'm not a regular traveller there. The Bakar Valley is filled with refugees from the war in Syria and they looked for gospel opportunity. They are residents of Beirut, they are locals, they had US citizenship, they could have fled somewhere else to a more comfortable world to live in, but they stayed there because God gave them gospel opportunity in a world that was deeply opposed to Jesus. Christians had their throats cut, that's how deeply... Do you have that same gospel heart or you're just defending your comfortable worlds? I fall into the defence of my comfortable world easily. I don't know about you. Do we have that gospel heart? If God is in control, he gives us lots of opportunities to go about his plans and purposes, even if it means the temperature rises. God wants us to make disciples of all the nations. Just one last thing. There's so much more you could say about gospel conversations. I will recommend a book for you a little later on, um, but I'll do that later on, not today. Uh, The last thing I think we should get from this passage is actually, we'll pick up on it again next week. Um, When Ezra is reminded that God is in control, he was discouraged. God's people had been discouraged for a while, actually. It looks like in Ezra chapter 4 that those opposed to God were setting out to discourage the work of God. It's a bit overwhelming when the nation is opposed to you. Even the great king over you stops the work that you're to do. But in chapter 7, verse 28, Ezra realises that God can even work through Artaxerxes, the pagan king. He is encouraged and spurred on to the task ahead. Now, we need to be people who see that God is in control not who wait until everything works out well for us and then move on. One of the things we read in our second reading was that God's people are guaranteed tough times and yet we're called to make make disciples of all the nations. God will not always be on our side. Sorry, God will always be on our side. The, The governments will not always be on our side. Let me get that one right. Actually, we'll always be on God's side, if I could put it more theologically correct. We are people who are, should be encouraged with the task ahead. Sure, we might wondering how God might do it, but we should just get on with doing it, no matter how big it might seem, to share the good news of Jesus with our family and friends, our next-door neighbours, our colleagues, to share the good news of Jesus throughout the whole world. How is God wanting to use you? Why don't I pray? Now, Lord, now God, as we think of the task that you've given us to make disciples of all the nations, may we know that you are sovereign. Your plans and purposes will not be thwarted. May we get on with serving you. May we be people who know your word, who obey it and who teach it because you are working and your plans and purposes will come to pass because you are sovereign. Help us not to be filled with fear and outrage. Help us to show love to those that mock those mock things they don't even understand. Help us to love others and proclaim Jesus. Help us to do so in a way that honours the gospel. that honours you, that invites people to know you. 
And we ask this, Lord, in your precious name.